It's always a topic that's difficult to speak about for me personally because there's so much sensationalism associated with the ideas of reincarnation and past lives and all of that because human beings gravitate to the exotica, to the unknown. Some of us don't have control over our present lives and we're more focused on our previous lives. And I find that often it's more an escape type of crutch. If I know what I was like in a previous life, maybe it explains some things about my life. But in truth, though there's much to say, it has to be approached in a much more subtle and sophisticated way. That's why I began to appreciate the line that they say about Kabbalah and mysticism. Those that say don't know, and those that know don't say. Because those that truly appreciate and understand Kabbalah and mystical teachings know that it has to be presented in a responsible way. It's not meant to be a drug or a crutch or something sensational because then it defeats the purpose. And the one word that's important to always remember in this type of discussions is responsibility. If the teachings lead you to be a more responsible human being, more accountable, more dedicated to growth and introspection, then you know you've reached a certain level of sophistication in these discussions. If it's simply satisfying another sensational whim, and it does not lead to responsibility, and leads more to like excuses, or uh, as I said, crutch, or avoiding the issues, then you know it's not really being studied or taught the proper way. So then, of course, this is the catch-22. Anything I say can be used against me, because as I just said, those that know don't say, and those that say don't know. So if I'll be saying, I don't know. Well, I'll have to leave you to determine that. But because we do live in, I would say, absurd times, so sometimes in the times that are not regular times, irregular times, you have to do irregular measures. And I take the cue from my own teachers and masters who are great Kabbalists. And whatever they did say, it was only a very little tip of the iceberg of what really was there. But because we live in a time where the teachings of mystical and inner esoteric teachings actually are necessary, to create a relationship with your soul, with God, with purpose. And with so many distractions, that's why a certain uh, license was given to address this, even though some may abuse it and some may misuse it, but still, because it can help people, we do speak about these ideas, not necessarily in the full glory, and also in a way that a person has to go and study and exert themselves and immerse themselves, but yet... It is given to us, and there's actually an analogy from Rabbi Shneur Zalm of Liadi on this topic, where he was exactly that. His colleagues and uh, seemed to challenge his propagating and perpetuating the teachings of mysticism that was always reserved for the elite, for those that appreciated, for those that had really earned their right to enter the inner chambers of the mystical. And at that point, at that moment when they were speaking, a page of one of the mystical teachings, of Hasidic teachings, was seen on the floor. And the colleague pointed to Rav Shneir Zalman. He said, you see, it's on the floor. It's being abused. It's not even being appreciated. It should be held and cherished. And here it's just on the floor. So Rav Shneir Zalman responded. He said, he gave an analogy, a famous analogy, of a child who fell ill, the child of a king. He was the only heir to the throne. And no doctors could not in any way find any way to heal him. Finally, one doctor from some distant land came and said that if we take this rare stone, which is in the king's crown, it was the, it was the prime jewel, the crown jewel of the king's crown, and you crush it, it means you have to destroy it, and you mix the powder with water, perhaps in the clenched teeth of the comatose child, perhaps that can be an elixir, a healing. The, the king, without hesitation, what do I need the crown for? What do I need my kingdom for if I don't have my child? So even though much of it will pour on the floor and only a drop may drop in and only a doubt that may save the child is worth it. We live in a spiritually comatose time, especially with the comforts of material life. We're distracted and it's harder to be in touch with your inner soul. So we were given this license to be able to deep, dig deeper into these mystical teachings, into the crown jewel, and even though some of it may end up in, uh, on the floor, meaning abused or misused, yet it's worth it because it may save a life, and literally save a life, and give us the vitality necessary 
to live passionate, exciting lives where spirituality is more important than materialism. As the saying goes, not that we are physical beings on a spiritual journey, but we're spiritual beings on a physical journey. And that's a perfect segue to the topic at hand, because we're going to be speaking about souls. What is life? So if life is seen on a biological, scientific level as simply a, uh, the heart beating, the mind working, and then death is death. Some call it the end. That, from our myopic view, may make, make a lot of sense. But it's a myopic view. It's from our little box. But those that understand that the soul is a far more complicated entity and one that was much more mysterious than we can ever know, realize that there's much more going on to the life journey. So the more you're aware of the soul, the more we can understand the topic at hand, which is past lives. So here's the, the question. Did we have, do we actually have past lives? Do you, were you here before? What are these premonitions at times you meet somebody or you go to a location and you have an encounter and there's a deja vu? Or you sometimes you see a little child even. It seems like they have an old soul. You know, there's experiences, certain resonating truths. Where does that come from? Can we even identify past lives? And what impact does it have on our lives today? These are the key questions that need to be addressed. And those are just the beginning. The questions go on in that ever, never-ending quest and curiosity of what really lies behind our life journey. And it's exactly that word that we need to be using, the operative word, journey, a journey. So I've often spoken about this. People ask the question after a death, after a passing, where does the soul go to after it leaves the body? And it's always a difficult question to answer. Years ago, I had an epiphany. I realized the question itself is based on a false premise. And that premise is that we say, we're, here's where we're at, and we're wondering where the soul goes to. Maybe this is not where it's at. But that's our subjective, as I said, myopic perspective. We, we are where it's at. So I developed this uh, half-humorous analogy. Think of an imaginary conversation, dialogue between a refrigerator and electricity. And the refrigerator says to the electricity, where do you go when they pull the plug? And the electricity responds with an incredulous indignation and tone and says, what kind of nerve do you have to ask me that question? Where do I go? Where did you come from? You're a little box that they just invented in the last century or two. And they figure out how to generate electricity and contain it in this box called a refrigerator to refrigerate and keep food cool. And you ask me where I go? I was here long before this box. You, the box, was created. And I will be here long after you're gone. So you're a little box. From your perspective, you only see things from the box. Thinking in the box. So you ask me where I go. I go back to my natural place, which is not confined in your limited structure. In your limited parameters. It's called the box. I go back where electricity is. Is it beyond time and space? At least beyond physical time and space as we know it in a tangible sense. Think about it, and yes, you suddenly realize <laughs> our questions are sometimes built on a premise which is a false assumption, and that is that we are the center of existence. So if something we don't see with my eyes means it's not here. Is that really true? What about love, truth, soul? What about subatomic particles? The reality is that the forces that really make the world tick are actually invisible to our eyes and to our senses. And yet we have ways to measure it. So we become trapped sometimes by the empirical proof that if you don't experience it in a tangible way with your five senses, it doesn't exist. That's a falsity. That's a fall. That is absolutely wrong, patently false. The analogy that I think it was Eddington who gave the analogy to Sir, Sir Arthur, um, was it Eddington? Yeah. He was asked the question, you're coming to all these weird conclusions, spooky conclusions from quantum mechanics, and no one has even, even, even ever seen a subatomic particle. No one's ever seen an atom, let alone a subatomic particle. And he gave the analogy of the fisherman who spread his net across the seas and gathered fish of all sorts and all species and all sizes and colors and shapes and so on, and began documenting. And then came to a conclusion after his, all his research 
There are no fish in the sea that are shorter than a half inch long. Brilliant. He was about to make the big announcement before the wizards of the world when his little daughter said to him, let me see the net you used. They look at the net. The net had ropes with spaces that were half inch. So what happened to all the fish that were shorter than a half inch long? You don't need to be a scientist to know. They fell right back into the water. So one little qualification. Yes, there are no fish in the sea shorter than a half inch long when you use a net of half inch spaces. If you use a net that's lesser than that, you'll get more fish. So it's the instrument that is flawed or limited, not the reality. You can't use your physical eyes, naked eyes, or even a microscope to see subatomic particles. You need other instruments, like in this case. A net of that size won't work. The same thing is when we experience things that are beyond material. You need tools that are commensurate to what it is that you want to experience. Someone will say, I don't see love. I don't hear it. I can't smell it. I can't t- touch it. I can't taste it. Yeah, those are not the senses of love. Love can express itself through senses. But love is not defined by the senses. You need other tools. What are the tools? You need love in your heart. Love sees love. Love is touched by love. And the same is with any reality. So when you're talking about the human being, the first and most important axiom, and I'm saying it as an axiom because I don't want to spend this entire program just trying to prove the case that there is something that's beyond material, I'm assuming that. If someone has a question about that, we can talk about it another time. That there is something about life that is more than biological, heartbeat, and functional organs, the vital organs at work. That there's something that you can call the spirit, you can call the soul, you can call electricity. But it's something that changes upon death and changes upon birth. Something enters and something leaves. And yes, it is a, a, a comparable to electricity and an appliance. Of course, here we're talking about a spiritual electricity. It's more than just electricity that gives, that gives uh, off energy. Here's an electricity that also gives you personality, and gives you character, gives you faculties, and defines who you are as a human being. Your body is the vehicle, but it's your soul or your spirit that is the force behind that vehicle. When you love someone, when you have a relationship with someone, who do you have a relationship with? You may love what they look like and you may want to embrace them physically, but the connection is one that is the human connection. It's not two pieces of wood or two, God forbid, corpses having a relationship. The relationship is based on something that is not definable by sensory tools, though it can be expressed with our senses and though the senses can have some maybe inkling, but it's primarily defined by soul meets soul. Like a face is reflected in water, so one heart is reflected in another. I show you love, and you can feel it. And you reciprocate in kind. So the first thing to establish is that we are actually spiritual beings in a physical journey, not physical beings on a spiritual journey. And that this journey began long before we entered this world, when your soul entered your body at the moment of conception, And nine months approximately later, the birth of becoming an independent individual, developing and growing into an adult. And upon death, the reverse happens. Soul separates from body, like electricity from an appliance, like water from a cup, like energy from a container, and the the body remains lifeless and slowly will decompose. And the soul continues the journey, the same journey that it began that was, the, uh, was on before it entered this realm. And this realm is like the, electri- like the electricity contained by the refrigerator, except here, obviously it's a little more sophisticated than a refrigerator and electricity, but the analogy is clear. Now here's the big question. This journey that we get continues on after death and, be, and continues and began long before birth, does the journey just continue? Or did the life, the time that this electricity spent in your body, your soul bent in your body, make a difference? The answer is it absolutely makes a difference. Because it came for a purpose. And that purpose is part of the journey. So think of the journey as in legs, several legs of the journey. There's a leg of the journey where the soul is on its own. There's a leg of the journey that the soul enters the body. And there's a leg of the journey that after the experiences in this lifetime, in this realm, in this domain, the electricity continues outside of the body and continues its journey now impacted by what you achieved in this world or did not achieve 
which we'll discuss momentarily. This journey could have also included previous lives where that same energy entered previous body, like a previous appliance. And it did whatever it did, then continued, and then reincarnated into your body. Now, what's the logic and the signs behind it? It actually quite makes a lot of sense. Imagine you send someone to do a job. You, know, you hire someone or you volunteer. Go ahead and do the, fulfill this and this mission. And they're off. They come back, and you know what? They fill 10% of the mission. Or 90%, but not all of it. They may even have messed up, and this, this, what do you do? You need the job done. So you'll send a, either a replacement or this person again to finish the job and correct what was mistake, what, what, what the wrongs that were done. That's the science behind the soul's transmigration. In Hebrew, there's a word called Gilgal. Gilgal means like a wheel, a cycle. A cycle is a part of a journey. So a soul will enter the body with a purpose. The distinct purpose is to refine that body, to refine that corner of the world you were given and allocated. In the words of the Kabbalists, to elevate the sparks of your life. That may be the food you eat, the encounters you have, the work you do, the hobbies, your travel, your vacation, your relationships, everything. We've talked about this a number of times, about everyone's allocated their sparks. Your soul is like a flame, and like a flame, it gathers sparks. And wherever you touch, you have the ability to warm and illuminate that experience, or to leave it untouched, or, unfortunately, to misuse or abuse it. So the soul has a mission. If it fills the, fulfills the complete mission, it's done its job. But if it only 90% or 80% or 10%, then the soul leaves this domain returns to its continuing journey and will return again to finish the job. So you can technically have one soul returning several times in different lifetimes to finish one bigger job. Now, if God forbid there was also damage done, let's say the soul in this body hurt people or did things that were inappropriate, not only did not fulfill their mission, but actually digressed and caused more problems than it solved, So it has to also return to fix and repair those issues. And often, it may interact with a soul that once was here that you may have hurt in a previous lifetime and return to reconcile, to remedy. That's the logic of it. So it's based on the concept of a soul's journey. A soul's journey is not defined by the parameters of our box. It's defined by a higher choreography. And the choreography includes a central type of spiritual immune system that should a soul not finish his job or do something that it needs to correct, it will continue to, to evolve, it will continue to transmigrate and return, perhaps in a different body, not perhaps, in a different body to finish or to conclude or to finish a part of that job. But this is also the mysteries of what's called Teres HaGilgal, which is the doctrine of reincarnation, the doctrine of this life soul's journey. And this requires a lot of knowledge, a lot of refinement and preparation to really be a master of this. And this is where you're not going to find true masters that are ever going to tell you, oh, you? You come from that lifetime. Why? Because as I said at the outset, it's only about responsibility. You will only be told what you need to be told. Because if you really need to know, when you, were, when you arrived to this world, you would have been given, here are the lifetimes that you're coming to finish up. That's not necessary for us to know. Is it a fact that it is part of that journey? Yes, it is. But do we need to know about it? And how much we need to know, that all comes down to how much you need, the knowledge is going to help you in your journey. Sometimes it can be a distraction. So the fact that we may have premonitions and we may have certain dreams or we may have certain experiences can be a reminder of that, but it's not something we are actually encouraged to pursue. I'm speaking on the topic because we want to talk about the topic itself. But is it something that we must pursue? Not necessarily. If you need to know, you will be told. It's based on the principle that you will be given everything you need to fulfill your mission. The most important thing is you're given life. You're given the opportunity. Are you going to use it? 
you need to know exactly what was done previously and what was missing and what was not necessarily. Just suffice it to say that whatever you encounter is part of your mission. And you have to do whatever it takes to make sure this time you realize it. In a way, you could even argue that if you were told, then you may ignore certain opportunities. Someone comes your way and asks you for a favor, you'll say, oh, that favor was already done in a previous life. And we don't want to have that type of attitude. So once you're here, you have to maximize it. You can't say, maybe I'm only here to do one good deed, do one charitable act. No, you're here now to do everything. But the real driving purpose of why you came is to finish up a certain job. But that job can be also a lot of jobs. All this is not something necessarily that we, each of us know. But we do know that it's part of a journey. And there's a certain humility in not having to know all the information. It's a humility of recognizing that you are part of a journey, but it's also tremendous empowerment. That you have the gift because you are indispensable. The job cannot be done without you. That's why your soul returned. So you could say, using the analogy of electricity and um, the appliance, that the soul is somewhat like electricity with a memory. Because electricity in an appliance is really passive and, in, um, and dispassionate and indifferent to what happens inside the appliance. The dialogue I mentioned is, a, is an imaginary dialogue. The case of a soul, a soul is with a personality. When you do a good deed, when you warm someone else's heart, when you do a loving gesture, when you bring light into this world, whether it's for a family member or it's for a stranger or for yourself or for anyone, your soul is enriched by it because the soul is actualized in the process. I've discussed this a number of times. The soul is made up of, not made up of, the soul has faculties. And just like the body needs to be exercised, the, each muscle in its own way, each part of the body in its own way, the soul also needs exercise. How do you exercise it? By using it. So if the soul has chesed, has kindness in it, by being kind, not only are you helping the other, you're helping yourself because you're exercising and conditioning the spiritual muscle called kindness. So the soul is more than just a life force, electricity. It's electricity with a, an experience. Electricity experiences that, that kindness and gets stronger. If, God forbid, a person does not actualize their kindness, so it remains dormant, and it's like a faculty that you've never used. And how sad. <coughs> and then the soul has, has way not been affected. And the way you could also say it's gone backwards. That soul will need to return to finish that, to actualize itself. <coughs> so the soul it carries the memories of the experiences that it, that it, it, uh, exper that it the experiences that it experiences in this world. A memory is not just as a memory, it's in its so-called memory banks. And it defines the soul's journey as it continues on. Both in satisfying and giving deep pleasure into the actualization of the soul when it does fulfill its part of the mission. And also the pain and the fact that the, the deprivation that it experienced by not fulfilling it. So when the soul returns, the soul feels compelled actually to finish the job. It's like saying, I wasn't finished, I need to come back and do, and do it right and correct the wrongs or improve or fulfill things that were not done. It takes on a whole new approach to life when you think of it this way. And that's why it's relevant for us to know. If it leads us to more being more responsible, to being more, uh, more introspective, to be more deliberate and more methodical, what you could say, more... Uh, what's the word I want to use, more uh, accountable about every experience, knowing that this experience is coming your way for a very particular reason, because you need to do something here. It, it, it leads and introduces a new sense of urgency to all of our lives, to every detail, because no detail is too small. Everything is part of this larger mission. So yes, we each are on a mission in this world. That mission will be accomplished by hook or by crook, hopefully in our lifetime. And if not, there's an immune system at work that will make sure it will get done. Now we're also told, since I said in our lifetime, where do we stand now? We're told that most of the Gilgulim have been finished, which means most of the work has been done in refining this world. And we're now at the last stage, maybe the, the last reincarnation. 
But that's really another discussion. I don't want to go into detail. It just you have to think of life as a cumulative. The fact that we live in a world that has so much humanitarianism, so much charity, so much um, civility and morality. Despite our challenges, I know people say it's the worst of times. It's not the worst of times, my friends. Less war, less violence. In every possible statistic, it's a better world. There's still work to be done. Individuals still can be horrible to each other. But overall, collectively, the cumulative positive energy has achieved a much. And therefore, we live in a far more peaceful world, in a world where we do not have to be afraid as we once were of oppression and aggression and so on. Still, I didn't say don't lock your doors. There's still things to be careful of. There's still, as I said, criminals and injustices. But cumulatively, the human race has done a lot in making this a better world. We still have work to do to bring the Messiah and to bring the world to its culmination. When the mission, so to speak, is accomplished completely, then the mission will continue on in its own way, which is, again, not the scope of our discussion. But the fact of the matter is that much has been done. So we are now, in a sense, what's called sometimes finishing the last fragments, repairing the last broken fragments of the shattered containers of the world of chaos, of Toihu, in our collective and individual effort of accumulating and elevating the sparks. That's where we're at. The words of my great Rebbe, our great Rebbe, said that we already finished refining and separating the sparks. But there's still work to be done to recognize it and to actually become aware of it and be consciously living that type of higher consciousness. So we have work to be done. In his words, we have to open our eyes to see these, this progress and to live by it and finish. The most important final frontier is our awareness of it that we're part of it. But I don't want to digress. I want to go back to the topic at hand. So yes, indeed, the, life, the journey of life is one that is going on for a while. And we are one leg of it. And we know only a little part of that leg, even that which we're conscious of. Look how little we know. What do we know about the human body? This five, six foot frame, 100, 150, 200 pounds. We'll stick to that number. What do we know of this body? So we have many advances, but there's still more, so much we don't know. Look at the areas of fertility, reproductive organs. Look at the brain, this brain, a little larger than the size of the palm of my hand. What do we know? We know some things, so much more to know. And that's right in the conscious experiences. How about the superconscious soul experiences? So this is not about... Uh, this is not about putting us down that we know so little it's about recognizing that there's much bigger picture here and you have the honor to be part of the bigger picture I feel uplifted by that I feel uplifted that I don't know it all and that there's a higher choreography at the same time it's incumbent upon us is to figure out as much as we can to make sure we live up to that higher choreography that we do our part in creating the mosaic that is the fusion of all the different parts, all of harmony within diversity, the large cosmic musical symphony that each of us contributes to. And each generation and each time they play the song, if they didn't play it completely, the soul will come back to finish the song or to correct the part of the song that it sang in the wrong way. It's so uplifting to know this. It means you are vital, you're indispensable, and you've returned in order to finish something but it's not just a trivial finish. This finish could be a major part of it. Or even if it's not major, it's not done until you do that, until you do the finishing. So it's very uplifting and very empowering to know this relationship with our past lives. Now, someone will say, it's very intriguing, but I really am curious about a past life. I really feel that I know this person, we both deja vu, connect, or as I mentioned before, we see certain children have like an old soul. So, I would suggest we don't have to pursue finding out exactly. If you do feel that, so fine. Act on it. Have a special relationship with that person. If that child is that way, communicate. Maybe you'll find insights. Be kind. Let it translate into deeper relationships. It doesn't always have to become a quest of figuring out what exact previous life was in, what century did I live, what country, in which world. I know we're very curious, and that's what we'd like to find out. But it may not be relevant. 
What's most irrelevant is that you're most relevant is that you are aware of it and sensitive, and you're acting on it. It should make you a kinder, more compassionate person, a kinder, gentler soul, knowing that you have that connection. And interestingly, I'll take it a step further. When you have that soul awareness and you're soul conscious, soul centric instead of body centric, spiritual centric instead of material centric, you know what happens? You begin to actually open up doors to previous experiences and previous lives because you begin to see and recognize the soul in others and suddenly realize, you know, we have something in common and let's do something together. You begin to recognize, not just coming your way, you begin to recognize deeper story of your life. You meet someone and you say, you know, it could have just been a business meeting, it could have been a casual meeting, it could have gone nowhere. But when you allowed yourself to think for the spiritual set of eyes, through, like I said, soul-centric eyes, soul-centric lens, then what do you come to experience? Maybe there's a reason we met. Maybe we can help each other a certain way. Maybe I'm here to do you a favor. Maybe you're here to do me a favor. Maybe we're here to join and perhaps our intersection is to bring a better good to, to others, to the human race. If you're constantly thinking of these type of spiritual opportunities, they come your way. And then you know what happens? You're actually connecting the dots. You're connecting the, 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 the t- tying up the threads of the reincarnative, the transmigra- transmigratory journey of the soul. Now, you may not know exactly where what was in a previous life, what place in the world and what exact details and the name of the person, but you know that you're part of it. And you know my connection with this person is deeper than just the here and now. So think of it this way. Every interaction you have, every person you meet, every opportunity, every location you you encounter, every place you travel to, is part of your life journey. And most likely part of finishing and continuing, I should say, continuing, continuing and sometimes finishing work that was done in this location or work that was done with this person in a previous life. So not just is it spiritually significant to have an interaction like this, a richer interaction than just a materialistic one, it actually connects and so-called cleans up and ties the knots of a larger choreography. If you think of it of a long, of a long book, a long novel, long narrative and the different parts of the narrative have been already told and now you're coming and you're writing and they're coming to the last chapter the last chapter brings together the characters the plot the drama and so on you are doing that so you're tying together things that were developed and led up to this moment and when you do that you can finish the story the narrative the entire narrative not just of our lifetimes of previous lifetimes, of previous times and places, all become connected in these last chapters that we are writing, that we are contributing to. It's a tremendous meditation, but more than meditation, it's tremendous motivation for taking on life, carpe diem, for seizing the day and not losing an opportunity, for recognizing that we're not just here to entertain ourselves and to indulge and for momentary pleasures and instant gratification we're here to tell a story we're here to finish the narrative complete continue the narrative complete it and finish it that's a whole different take on life if you live that way with that type of consciousness think of what it does enriches every interaction every experience in ways that are even hard to imagine because we can't even expect it it's so so much of some of it is so much of it is unexpected but so rich. You go to a place on vacation, you think you're going on vacation, but then you look, keep your eyes open for the unexpected, for the unplanned. You meet somebody, you have an interesting conversation. Who knows where that will take you? And that opens up a whole new vista of horizons of things that are outside of the box, things that in, are introduced that come from that spiritual side of electricity that is beyond this box, beyond many, all boxes, that have been here before, that will continue their journey. And you get suddenly plugged in to this bigger picture. It's like climbing up on the mountain and now you see the bird's eye view. Not just your narrow moment, your narrow space. So it changes our entire perspective on life when we understand this idea of the transmigration of souls, of your soul having been here, and what impact it has on your life.
And it's not just words. This actually can transform. And I don't use that word lightly. To transform your way of looking at yourself, your relationships, and your life, and all your interactions. Because then everything, from the most trivial, just commuting, going shopping, tying your shoelaces, to the most significant, and everything in between, including your work, and your meals, and your travels, and your finances, and all that, all becomes part of a larger story. Some of it we're directly aware of, and most of it we're not. And so be it. You're now on stage in this long play. I use the example of a story, a narrative, a musical composition. You're doing your part. You may not know about all the details in the previous frames, in the previous um, uh, scenes of this long play, this long narrative. You may know parts of it. You know, may have a glimpse of it. The most important thing is you know it's there. And now you're coming to do your part. You're now on stage. This is your leg of the journey. This is your voice. What are you going to do with it? Are you going to squander the opportunity? Are you going to, God forbid, the opposite, ignore it and be distracted and do something else that's not part of this deeper narrative and your calling and mission? Or, and of course that's the, the, what we should be choosing, that you will answer the call. You will rise to the occasion. You will sing your song and songs. You will continue the marathon, the story, the narrative, the music, the play that has been playing itself out. And you will make a mark, a positive mark that you and only you can make. And in doing so, you, f- you complete the cycle. So the concept of previous, previous, previous lives and past lives and past experiences, the cycle was not complete. That's why we're here. Now you may wonder, are there any souls that enter this domain that have never been here before? We're told there are. There are. But it's rare. It's called a, a new soul, a neshama chadasha. And those souls usually come to actually introduce something new and unprecedented, something pioneering. That's why they're new. This doesn't mean when we're old souls that were like old and used car or used... That's not what it means. It means that our role is to continue the narrative. And it doesn't mean we can't contribute. It doesn't mean we don't contribute tremendous elements to it. Because we can even go beyond our own so-called calling and do even more than necessary. But there are the rare souls from time to time that arrive that have their particular mission. But that's not a matter of superior inferiority. Each of us is indispensable. That's the bottom line. And that's why we're here. It's a tremendous, it's a remarkable take understanding of life when you see your life as this soul's journey, a journey that's been going on, a journey that continues to go on through you. And every moment you wake up in the morning, your contract is renewed. Your life is renewed with this mission. And of course, when I say mission, mission is far more than just one mission. We're blessed with, hopefully, with long life, with healthy years, and we're given those strengths because the mission is complex. The mission is multifaceted. There's many elements to it, many directions, many details to it. So that is our way of looking at life. Now there are books. There's a particularly the name of the, the Arizal. Isaac Luria has actually a great mystic of the that lived in the 15th century. He actually has um, 15th century, yeah. he has a book called Sefer Gogolim, the Book of Reincarnation. Gilgulim, again, means cycles. He has also a book called The Gate of Reincarnation. These are very um, interesting books where he actually tells the students about t- different reincarnations, the previous lives that they come from. But they were at a level that they could and needed to hear it because they had reached a level that they needed to know more because they had already had earned their way by being responsible and doing their job. It wasn't just sensationalism. It wasn't sensationalism at all, I should say. Now, in the Zohar, which goes back almost 2,000 years of the Rav B'Shim Bayachai, and actually transcribed by Rav Abba, his student, there there's a, the, in the chapter, the Zohar is structured on the chapters of the Torah, the chapter of Mishpatim, which we'll be reading in a few weeks. Elam Mishpatim, these are the laws. So it says, these are the laws of Gilgulim, of reincarnation. There it's a little more cryptic, 
But I just wanted to say there are actual texts that talk about this at length. But it's advanced material because they don't begin by speaking about what exactly it is. They already talk about the more complicated dynamics of Gilgulim, of how it works exactly. But for us, what we should know and need to know is our soul is alive. Our soul is traveling and has been traveling and continues to travel. A soul is a restless flame. It never stops traveling. Not in our lives and not before our lives and not after. And that's why we also don't call it afterlife, which suggests after. It's the continuing journey, just in a different form. So the one example you can think of it is if you think of taking water and liquid. You, you heat it, it turns into gas. You cool it, water. You freeze it, ice. It's the same entity in different forms. The soul continues its journey just in a different form. The lavush, the garment it has during this lifetime, its appliance is the body you know. But then it continues through other garments. It may t- turn from an ice liquid, which is much more a garment we can relate to, to a gas, which we don't fully sense or, or see. But we know it's there. So the soul's journey is a noble, majestic one here f- going on for thousands of years, and we are merited and blessed to be part of that journey. And that's how we have to look at it. So what are you going to do with that awareness, with that knowledge? And I rest assured that the more you do, the more you act on it, the more accountable you are, the more responsible you become, and not feeding into the sensational, more lower, lower common denominator, the more the secrets will be open for you. That's how it works. Because the secrets open up to the person who earns their way. The more you earn your way, like the Zohar says, that who can enter these higher lofty levels? Those that transform darkness into light and, and bitterness into sweet. So when you take this information that you learned and you utilize it and you implement it and you live up to it, new secrets will emerge in the area of soul's journey and other areas as well. Now, you know, if that's an incentive, great. It doesn't have to be an incentive. It's just a fact and reality. And that's how it is in everything. You climb up a mountain to a new horizon, you'll see new things. It's straightforward, but you need to climb. You can't force your way up, and it can't be induced. And it can't be done through someone else. It's through your life experiences, through your life journey. I feel it a tremendous, maybe the greatest honor to be part of this type of conversation where we talk about the thing that matters most, your journey, your soul's journey. What is more important? We get so distracted. Think of daily activities, everything we do all day. So much of it is the means to an end. So much of it is about the moment, short term. Yes, we need shelter and we need homes and we need sustenance. We need money and we need food and we need clothing and we need health. All vital. But those are means. The means to what? That your soul's journey should be able to go unfettered and travel to fulfill the mission of your soul, the mission of your life. That's what you need to ask yourself tomorrow morning, and every morning, and every day, throughout the day. What is my calling? Am I living up to it? That is the operative question in this entire discussion. As I said, it's a great, great honor to be part of this conversation, to stimulate the conversation, and to be part of the leg of your journey as we all intersect and I feel enriched by your soul's journey as much as hopefully I get en- hopefully you get enriched as much as I get enriched, I hope. That's the mission of the Meaningful Life Center. To make those links, to make those, to tie those dots together, to tie the threads, to connect the dots, that we all begin to experience our part of telling the narrative. And we all complement each other in this process. So any way that we, the Meaningful Life Center, and myself and our great team can do to help in this regard, please let us know. We're right now developing, and thank God we've gotten to a stage which you'll soon hear about, a, actually a course that talks about this precise, precise uh, theme. It's called Midlife Miracle, and it's about discovering your mission and calling in a very particular way. So we're excited to talk about that soon and other developing programs. Please stay in touch. We'll keep you posted. We'll uh, update you. And please update us about your life at MeaningfulLife.com. A lot of resources there. You can contact us. And, uh, of course, help support our effort 
in every way. It could be with your talents, with your skills, with your connections, and also financially at MeaningfulLife.com slash sponsorship or slash donate. You could sponsor a program like this or other programs in honor or memory of a loved one. May your soul have a very peaceful, but also a very uplifting and a very growthful, continuing journey that connects you with your own soul as it was in previous stages and previous legs of this life marathon of history. And may we all be merit to share with each other good news and only good news in a revealed way. Thank you very much.